welcome to episode 39 of the Woodwind Doubling Channel. And at long last, I'm getting out my oboe and bassoon to show you my uh, basic setups on those. We'll delve a little further into these instruments uh, later on and maybe do a little buyer's guide on how you can uh, get yourself a reasonable uh, oboe and English horn to, to start working as a doubler in this field. This oboe is a bit of an anomaly. Um, it's a stenciled instrument. Uh, they used to do a lot of uh, stenciling of uh, instruments from France with American brand names and things like that in the 60s, early 70s and that. So you'll find things like oboes that were made by, say, uh, Marigo uh, or Strasser Marigo Le Maire, as they were at the time, being branded King. You can sometimes find a really nice oboe that says King on it. Oboe players will tend to shy away from it because of brand snobbery, the, similar to what happens with flute players, clarinet players, and most other instrumentalists, uh, in, in fact. But you can actually find uh, some things like that. This one, actually, the name on it says Melody. Uh, from Paris, France, Melody Superior. It is actually a uh, Marigot stencil from that era. So it's uh, late 60s, early 70s uh, to a lot of, uh, you know, say professional oboists, uh, symphonic players and things like that. They'll also tend to pass over older instruments because they'll claim that they are blown out. Um, for doubler, somebody working in pits works perfectly fine. Uh, it does not have a third octave key on it, uh, but it does have everything else in a full conserv conservatory instrument that you'd want. It's got the uh, split ring E, it's got the uh, banana key there, it's got the uh, resonance keys, it's also got an added uh, left hand F. It originally didn't have one, it had, it had been added already when I got it. Makes it uh, perfectly fine for uh, any of the uh, things that I've ever run into in a show book. Plays very nicely top to bottom. Uh, in fact, when I took it into my technician, Gary Armstrong, um, he said, I, I've never heard of this particular make before. I said, just work on it, have faith in it. And he phoned me back uh, later on when he was just about done. And he said, yep, this is a really good player. It's a real deal. Then I told him what I paid, what I paid for it. And he was like, yeah, that's pretty unbeatable. So this has served me well. Um, uh, last time I was playing a show, I was doing uh, Pirates of Penzance, which was just a straight oboe book and uh, used this instrument throughout it. My, the, previously to that, I used a uh, Fox Model 330 which is a very worthy instrument of uh, doubler's attention, and we'll, uh, we'll devote a bit of episode time uh, on, uh, on selecting instruments to having a look at uh, some of Fox's offerings in terms of uh, synthetic but really usable in a professional sense oboes. <laughs> from English horn. This similarly is a, another slightly anomalous instrument. So in the 60s and 70s, Linton was having their instruments made in France by another company. Later on, that same company was bought out by, you guessed it, Marigo, who made my oboe as well. So it turns out that uh, the current Marigo English horn is basically the same tooling as this, but with uh, revitalized keywork. So um, got a really nice playing English horn. And again, it was a super deal when I took it into uh, Gary Armstrong and had him go over the thing. Uh, he actually uh, d had to do a full repad on this. And he said, uh, I don't know about this. And I said, trust me on it. And he phoned me back and said, yep, great playing instrument. And, uh, and I said, well, it's really no surprise because there's other uh, famous makers that use these uh, Malern English horns in the 60s as a basis for their instrument. Uh, for example, uh, the, uh, the famous Lauben uh, English horns were actually originally based on Malern's English horn bodies. Now, of course, he did more voicing and things like that, but that's what he started with as a basic, was basically the same English horn as this. This, again, has a full conservatory key work on it. Uh, does not have a third octave. Uh, third octave, I think, on an English horn is just kind of a waste of time. What I don't have on this particular horn that I would like to get added uh, before uh, Gary retires is a left-hand F. Fortunately, it's got a really good sounding uh, uh, forked F fingering, and also it's fairly easy to slide to the, uh, the standard F fingering on here. So I haven't really run into anything technically on English horn parts that I haven't been able to play. And English horn parts tend to be more sort of, you know, melodic, let's milk it, rather than uh, highly technical things. And for a lot of people, uh, it's more fun to play English horn on a show. You get all the nice melody bits and things like that. Uh, whereas oboe can tend to be doing a lot of running around more highly technical things. And oboe, to a lot of us doublers, is the awkward one, and, and English horn is just these ones. It's, I, I compare it to playing uh, alto sax versus soprano sax. Most people start in alto, they go to soprano, they find that a challenge because it's more finicky. 
uh, with the oboe family, you do the opposite thing. You start on the oboe, the finicky one, and then add the English horn later on. It's like, wow, the English horn's super easy compared to that. So there you go. Oh, and uh, reed-wise on my instruments. Uh, on my uh, oboes, I'm actually using uh, reeds that I make. Um, and we can go into cane and all the further stuff in that and reed making it another time, but those are, those are my own handmade reeds. Uh, the ones that I'm using on English horn are actually ones that I sourced a few years ago uh, when I was working at Gary Armstrong's shop, we started getting in some uh, Fox Renard English horns, which are the uh, they're a plastic, all plastic English horn, which is a really terrific instrument. If I had to go out shopping, I'd probably buy one of those now. Um, and they put in this reed that was made by uh, a different company. It wasn't one of their standard reeds. So I phoned them up, asked what it was, and they gave me the name of this place in uh, Maryland. And uh, I've been getting my uh, English horn reeds from there ever since. And uh, really, I English horn reeds tend to last so long, I don't find you really need to lay in a big stock of them. You know, I've maybe got like 10 of them in my case, and I've been using the same 10 for about the past uh, 12 years or so. Uh, they, they see less action. They don't get uh, so much wear, so you can keep playing on them. I'll probably go back uh, hunting for more of the uh, same when I get those later on. And, you know, there's some perfectly good uh, pros making really solid English horn reeds. I would... Uh, probably explore around on that thing. I don't have a lot of time for tweaking the English horn. I want to find something that goes on it and play it. The oboe, I'll spend more time because it's a little more finicky. So there you have it, uh, the basic uh, oboe and English horn setups that I use. If you have any questions, please leave them below. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please hit the subscribe button so you can follow along uh, my adventures in the uh, land of woodwind doubling. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.